Thank you so much, Daniel, and all the people at Arndell. Super excited to be here. I've always loved this community, and you know, it's been probably two, three years now that I've been in the DAO space. And Arndell was one of my first, I would say, like cross pollination um, journeys in meeting this community. It felt like a very kindred spirit to the work that we were doing at Talent DAO, really trying to advance quality research insights and practice within the space. And so super, super excited that we're at this juncture with so much more development that's happened over the last few years. Um, my background is um, basically, if I could sum it up, it's a deep, deep devotion to developing people to have a healthy and amazing relationship with the work that they advance in this world. I feel very deeply called to focus on leadership because I think it has an immense impact on organizations and people's livelihoods. I think everybody wants to find work that's fulfilling and meaningful and also covers their base needs. And especially when we forge our way into this new horizon of work with DAOs, I think it becomes that much more important that we study this concept and that we learn from it and learn what it means to be leading in a more decentralized, flat, organizational world. And um, part of what's led me to here is 15 years working in large, more bureaucratic, hierarchical organizations. Uh, in my Web2 background was owning leadership development portfolios and trying to figure out how to square peg into a round hole of how do we help everyone see themselves as the leaders that they are and develop them as the leaders that they are. And so it's no um, coincidence that I found my way to DAOs where it's a little bit more inherent in the structure to allow for that mindset to emerge. Um, I also have my PhD in organizational leadership and continue to teach graduate students at the University of Minnesota. So I always have one foot in research and one foot in practice. And that's that's the bridge that I like to construct for myself in this space. And so with that being said, I'm so excited that you've all joined to hear and learn a little bit more about leadership in DAOs. But really what I believe is that it's indicative of what leadership in the future that is more decentralized and um, more able to allow for everyone to step into their own leadership what I believe it, it has in store for us. And so if you're joining here today, hopefully, can you see just um, my primary screen or do you see the little slides beneath? Just to do a quick check here. Yeah, we see the primary screen and we also see the slides underneath. Okay, well, let me see here. I just kind of want you to see the main slide. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so <laughs> welcome to this concept. Most importantly, I want you to turn up your own awareness and your own reflection on what does this mean for you? Some of you in your introductions mentioned that this topic is one that's of a passion of yours, or maybe you don't have a Web3 background, but you're very curious about um, this body of work. Or maybe you've been, you know, like Grace mentioned, six years in the space of DAOs and these organizations, and um, this is a specialization of yours. Regardless, I think it's important for all of us to turn our attention toward why this topic matters to you in this moment. And I love this quote by Gloria, which was one of the people we interviewed in one of our studies. She said that leadership in DAOs can come in a lot of different ways. It's not traditional like top-down leadership, but it's just creating a system where people's voices can be heard and creating clarity as to where those systems are. I think that's much more important in DAOs is having the structure rather than having the person. For those of you who are um, leadership geeks like myself, you'll know that a lot of research and that's been done on leadership, the first theories really began with what was called um, like a truly like a single hero or a single man sort of theory of leadership that it was really about one person charging up a hill with a flag that was gonna come save the day. And so this you can see is already quite a stark contrast to that of not having it be about the individual, but having it more be about the structure. So a couple of questions that I want you to contemplate and feel free to um, add your thoughts into the chat. 
And we've covered a little bit of this with our introductions, but I'm gonna invite you to just write a little bit more about why you're here today and what you are hoping to learn. And then Daniel, feel free to read some of those out too. 100%. Yeah, I guess, you know, maybe I'll, I'll start. So I'd say I'm here today because, you know, I'm really interested in, you know, uh, us, you know, it seems to me that there's a lot of different opportunities for leadership within DAOs, whether it's more, you know, hierarchical, if it's flat, you know, it seems like there's a, you know, a lot of different, um, you know, types of organizational leadership that's possible at DAOs. So really kind of interested and curious to see you know, what the possibilities of leadership are and, you know, what's worked well within these organizations and what hasn't. So that's that's what I'd say. Great. And as things come in through the chat, mm -hmm. um, feel free to share and others feel free to read and review. Sure. Uh, Catherine says, is there a future for leadership? How would it look? How can we move away from traditional view of leadership uh, and how to implement rotating leadership? Mm -hmm. And then Daniel says, I'm curious how, Lisa, your view on leadership is evolving as DAOs and generally Web3 struggles at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And anyone else? Okay, yeah. Yeah, um, if anyone else comes in, we'll we'll circle back to it. But uh, yeah, we have one more. Uh, Russo says, leadership is a word that I've uh, heard a million times, but I've never actually really deeply understood. And then Grace says, I'm just an R and Dow fanboy. So <laughs> love it. <laughs> okay. So um wonderful. Well, I can tell you that part of why I entered into the DAO ecosystem was I had learned about DAOs. I had learned about blockchain back in 2018. I was supposed to be tasked to finding out what are the capabilities on the horizon that we need to skill leaders up in. And within the organization that I was a part of. And as part of that, blockchain was one of them. So that was my introduction. But at the time, our organization was using it primarily for supply chain transparency. So you could, in the United States, buy your Thanksgiving turkey and you could find out what farm that turkey came from. And so it didn't seem like this all-encompassing, really important infrastructural shift at the time, for me, at least from where I was sitting. Um, what became more clear in 2020, 2021 is I started mining helium and started seeing helium as a, a use case for a decentralized version of telecommunications. And that really started opening up my eyes to this idea that there are infinite applications to this, that there are these paradigms that we've just had instilled in us for centralization that can really be busted open. And yet I knew why I wanted to come to DAOs and why DAOs would be the place that I would really spend most of my time. And it was because I'm interested in the social transformation, the, the human phenomenon around this technological innovation of blockchain and cryptocurrency and what, what the world will construct with it. But that inevitably will have an impact on human beings and we want those human beings to thrive. And so I really came into DAOs and was a founding member of um, Talent DAO looking to explore this question through research, which was how do we develop stronger leadership across the DAO ecosystem? Maybe before that, it was even like, what does leadership look like in the DAO ecosystem? And so to really answer this question, we um, set out to do a two-phase study, and I was fortunate enough to lead this body of work, but to have really amazing partners specialized um, in each phase of the work. And so the first one, I worked with an amazing um, researcher who specializes in doing research on research. And what we did for this first phase was really looked at, okay, DAOs are, are fairly new. So how do we look at what's already been done and not ignore you know, the giants that we could possibly stand on their shoulders? And so what we did was we did a rapid systematic review that looked at systematic reviews and meta-analyses. What this encapsulated was basically 40 studies that represented 5,400 primary studies that represented over 100,000 participants in a broad range of industries and really narrowed in on shared collective and distributed leadership studies uh, over the past 25 years. And so the whole goal for this was, what can we maybe apply to this new emergent space from what we already know? 
And from this, we came up with what we believe is a very helpful definition, and again, an early stage one, of what leadership in DAOs looks like. Um, in the past, maybe it was a status, a title, a person, an individual, but really in this space, we think that leadership in DAOs is a dynamic emergent group property in which people flexibly lead one another. They are selectively using their skills and expertise based on the evolving needs and context of the DAO. Another key part of this is their sharing responsibility to perform specific leadership behaviors. And of course, like all leadership, the aim is to have behaviors that achieve group or organizational goals. And so this is really where we landed. I know one of you mentioned, I, I've heard the word leadership, but never really gone in depth on it. I can tell you um, after having my master's in leadership development, and my PhD in organizational leadership, that there's one word that in all the definitions scholars have come up with, which they've come up with thousands, <laughs> in all the definitions, one thing that seems to be synonymous with leadership is this notion of influence. And so that part becomes very clear, but how you influence one individual to another top down, the idea is that that shifts in this more decentralized world to being more of a dynamic process where people flexibly step up into a role that's needed for the moment. And so one of the things that we wanted to also debunk is what might still be the same what do we find that's been true of leadership research in the past that we also believe still holds relevance for a more decentralized future of work? And you can see that there are certain leadership behaviors that really quality research has done, or has done in these more distributed, shared and collective spaces to tell us that these behaviors still really matter. The first of which is that in the center, the nice little orange um, shape, you'll see that it's really still important for you to develop yourself. And Daniel, I know you're curious as to how my thinking has evolved. My thinking on leadership in DAOs, especially as DAOs are struggling, has definitely evolved to the personal leadership and personal fortitude being even more critical. And I'll explain and share a little bit more about why I believe that is. But I think that this is actually the space that warrants even more truly curated and intentional development than, than what we might do or see in traditional organizations. There's also these three areas. There's people leadership, which is about moving the people forward. You can see all the different things that that involves. It's about caring for one another. It's about um, your well-being. It's about being open to input. Then there's change leadership. And this is Often when people develop leaders in organizations, one of the things that the leader is really responsible for is to set direction. And in DAOs, you might have that be more through a crowdsourced version of it, but it still becomes important that there's a vision for change, that you're encouraging people going beyond traditional norms and that they're taking risks and pushing things forward. There's also then of course, um, what sometimes is the unsung hero of a lot of getting things done in organizations, which is the task leadership. And this is about setting clear expectations, planning tasks, clarifying responsibilities, role clarity, or that person who does onboarding to, to all your new members of your DAO, pretty critical. Um, people need that clarity when they come in. And so there's three different things that I like to tell people if you're looking to strengthen leadership within your DAO, something that you can do is really focus on how are you appreciating the people? They don't have to be there. They can leave there tomorrow. And so how do you really have a strategy or a mindset around how you will appreciate? Because one of the best things I can tell you about results in organizations is that you need to appreciate to accelerate. The more people feel appreciated, the more they give over that discretionary effort in order to achieve those group or organizational outcomes. Then there's also this idea of imagination. One of the um, pieces of research that I've spent the last few months working on is interviewing 41 different token engineers as part of a study with Token Engineering Commons. And I can tell you that one of their biggest disappointments over the last few years has been upon entering into the space, they thought, wow, tokens have this, this whole representation of value exchange that can span infinite boundaries almost. And yet, 
The disappointment comes in the fact that we've narrowed it to a lot of copy pasting happening around DeFi protocols and just viewing that token as, as a cryptocurrency or as a monetary value to economize. And so there's a lot of imagination that is still the work of leadership in this space of being that person that comes in and that challenges why we're doing the things that we're doing and isn't just copy pasting, but looking beyond the horizon of what's been done. And then of course, this last one with task leadership, clarification becomes so very important. There's an old marketing adage of, if you want people to hear something, you need to say it seven times, seven different ways. I still think that's very true. And in DAOs, especially when you've got new people coming in, one of the biggest things they want to know is how, how do I, what is my path for contribution? And so making that clear and helping people step into that dynamic of flexibly leading one another and feeling confident and psychologically safe to do that becomes really important. All right, so I'd love to just pause here. I know that was a lot of stuff from our first phase. I have a little bit more to share there before I move on to the second phase of the work we've done. But wanted to pause here and just say, what do you all see as some of the greatest leadership challenges and needs today? Because it, it is evolving and has evolved. Yeah, I mean, I'd say personally, um, you know, uh, oftentimes a lack of a clear direction that's communicated throughout the organization. You know, a lot of times people, um, you know, could be really galvanized if they were, you know, uh, really in line with the narrative of what the organization is trying to really, you know, embody and, and go out there and solve. But yeah, I guess that's that's my take. Great, thanks, Dana. Mm -hmm. Others? One of the challenges that I think is pretty serious is the this is tendency, like some of it's generational, some of it's because we're so technical, some of it's because we're so distributed, is that tendency to think that text is the same as talking to someone mm -hmm. and to try and like solve things that are skip meetings or just try and have things happen in a text-based context. And uh, you were talking about persuasion, like, and, and or you didn't use that word, but like influence. It's kind of hard to influence people without like a more humanity. And it's very hard to explain that to people today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very insightful. Ties in a lot with accountability. Rowan, I see you've got your hand up. I just, uh, what David shared actually got me thinking and what, what you were talking about, Lisa, um, towards the end of like, just before you paused about a path for contribution and I'll sort of paraphrase David's perspective as contributor alignment. Um, lots of people. And I think it's because we have kind of a, we have a legacy understanding of leadership. People transport that into, or they translate it or they bring it with them. They bring that baggage into not baggage in a bad way, but just like learned experience and understanding of power structures to the DAO where they're like, okay, cause I'm here. I want to help someone tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I had to, to unlearn because um, there's, well, people often don't have time to sit down and tell you what to do and how to do it. Um, but I, I learned very quickly that, it really does come down to um, alignment and um, understanding or um, sharing the perspective of the organization, because then it, then the, you don't need someone to tell you what to do. It becomes more, more clear. And it's hard to, it's hard to convey that shift, that unlearning to people I find. Um, so you're doing kind of the same thing like you're reiterating onboarding instructions and so on and so forth. But that only gets you, in my experience, that only gets you so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I think the whole principle of permissionlessness has helped people or been like a beacon for people to go on their own personal journey of unlearning, needing that permission. And yet um, it's hard in this climate right now for people not to just come in and perceive it as that, like you said, lack of time or lack of caring in order to help you out. And so it is this um, coming into relationship with each other that 
I'm seeing the most helpful onboarding experiences now consist more of like mentorship and having a live conversation. So you get that care, but you also get that person who can help you in that unlearning to nudge you to, you know, just go do it. Um, Jean Alvier, I see that you've got your hand up or Jean Alvier. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Yes. Thank you very much uh, for asking me. Uh, I wrote it in the chat box, actually. I see leadership as a multifaceted concept and I like being exposed to different approaches. Um, because I am interested in how we can weave more indigenous wisdom in leadership. Because I work with people from different continents, and this is maybe something which is missing now when we are working in different cultures. Mm -hmm. That was interest me. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that interest, and I think it's even more important in DAOs and just in the future of work, the future of work to me has even more porous boundaries between um, nation states, between governments, between DAOs, between how we view um, our shared human experiences. And in doing that, it also still requires that nuanced look at what does this mean for different cultures, for our roots, our backgrounds, our paradigms around how we interact with one another. Wonderful. Well, thank you. I'll share a little bit more. So at the end of phase one of looking at this 20, past 25 years of leadership literature and what we can learn from it and maybe cross apply, one um, precedent, I guess, that you want to set within your DAO is there's some key ingredients to even allow for shared leadership. If that's what we're really saying, you know, DAOs open up the door for is it's not this power over structure, but it's really this power with structure that we're looking to create. And if leadership is this dynamic process of people stepping into it, we need to seed the soil for shared leadership. And what that looks like is these three key ingredients. And so especially if you're part of a DAO right now or you're working, these are the three things that we want you, your core team at least, the people who are most invested in advancing the work of the DAO to be able to say yes to. And one of that is shared purpose that people know where you're going and how to get there. We already talked about, um, Daniel, I believe you mentioned how important it is for people to have that vision and know where you're headed and have that be communicated well. The second thing is this idea of social support. I know people will lend a hand if I'm in need. And again, this is that social glue. And, and I do think it can be harder in an asynchronous, anonymous, pseudonymous um, culture that's more text-based. And so as Grace was mentioning, when we feel that more human side to this, we also feel more socially supported, which allows us to feel more confident stepping into leadership, um, regardless from where we are within an organization. And then the last thing is voice, this ability to influence team directions and actions. So not only can I maybe influence others, but I really can influence the direction that this organization is headed. And that means when I vote, it actually matters or that means when a group votes, the there's no question whether the DAO will enact that vote or not. Um, and some of these things we've seen disrupted over the last few years based on different practices, or you, know, you think a decision is made, but then there's some private discord or telegram channel people didn't know existed that made the real decision. And so that all deteriorates the sense of voice and our ability to influence, influence the future. And so all these things are what we learned from research is important, but we also knew that simply learning from outside and trying to apply it inside this new context wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be the only way to go. And what we knew we wanted to do was really hear, you know, straight from the people who are living and working and leading in this space. And so the second study that we embarked on doing was a primary research study it's where we conducted one hour in-depth interviews with um, 23 different leaders in the space, most of which who ended up being founders. And again, the goal was not necessarily to have leadership be a founder, but the goal was for it to be people who had rich insights and experiences at various stages in a DAO's development. And then the, the research that we did was conducted over the end of 2022 and into early 2023. And so here's just some of the DAOs that um, were the experiences that were represented by the people that we interviewed. Um, as you can see, we had a number of DAOs that are 
well-established and have been around for a while, but also some that were newer and forming and had seen early successes and were already beginning to influence the larger ecosystem. The people themselves, we were really intentional about recruiting in, in a way that represented the future we wanted to see. You know, they say, and I, I love um, appreciative inquiry, which is basically like an open source way of looking at strength-based processes. And it's what I wrote my dissertation on for my doctoral studies. And one of the things that they talk about is people move in the direction of the images of their minds. And so what we didn't want to do was do a study that gave an image of, you know, just what we know is often a prevalent demographic in the space of, you know, white males, U.S.-based age 25 to 35. We really wanted to be intentional about who we recruited and who we think DAOs are for, which is for the people who want to access them. And really that, that can mean anybody around the world that's got something to contribute and is excited to do and move meaningful work forward in this world. And so what we did was we intentionally balanced for gender. Um, that was really important to us. And then we also looked at trying to get varying demographics in where people resided, um, what their background was, what their age was. And we think that this could be pushed even further in future studies. So what is leadership in DAOs? It takes on, it's multifaceted, so it takes on different dynamics. Leadership in DAOs is personal. And Cynthia from D Travel shared with us that ultimately leadership in DAOs is really about somebody stepping up to do what they are excellent or world-class at that provides a lot of value for the DAO. So there's this personal element to it, but there's also this relational or group level that you could look at or study leadership in. Um, providing courage and clarity to other participants in terms of how they can actually act within the community. It's what Rafa had shared with us. And then it also has this organizational level. So enabling work teams to be autonomous and productive from Renee. And so what we know is you can look at leadership through these different lenses. No one ever is going to agree on the one way to look at leadership or the one definition of leadership. And yet we know it impacts people on many different levels. So leadership in DAOs, there were a couple snippets that I thought helped better understand or color in this vision of what leadership in DAOs really looks like. You can see um, highlighted in orange, there's helping the group navigate, influencing the direction, providing the framework and the vision, and not created by position or pay. And I think these are some important distinctions from people that have been in the space, working in the space, and working to advance their DAOs of what it means to actually be leading. And when we asked the question in the interviews of, when did you first feel like you were leading? This was really meant to get at, you know, again, just a different way of what, what indicates to somebody that they're actually stepping into that role of leadership. And Grendel um, shared that it wasn't a specific moment, it's this evolving context. And Humpty from Crypto Sapiens, also work with Bankless, said, when someone trusted me to make sound decisions, which again, kind of shows the relational nature of what it means. You can't really have leadership without some followership, um, some people trusting you to do something. And then um, Livia from the TEC shared, I was leading when I stopped thinking I was dumb. <laughs> and I think we've all kind of had that moment going down the rabbit hole where you realize like, oh, maybe I've actually, I, I know more than I realized I knew. And so this is what um, came out of the study after talking to the 23 participants about their journey through entering into DAOs and taking on different roles of leadership and ultimately, a lot of them, when they talked about leading, they used the phrase advancing the work of the DAO. And so that's just a nice little snippet to think about leadership in DAOs is when are you advancing the work of the DAO? Most of them expressed that they would enter into DAOs, they'd go down the rabbit hole, they'd be excited by all the possibilities. But then ultimately, there was this reconciling with the fact that they themselves or their organization had some limitations that there weren't these quick fixes to. And that often led people into a bit of a slump that Valley could be experienced multiple times over. This isn't like a one-time one chronological narrative, 
But um, it also led to a lot of people taking very different routes. Um, many just experienced extreme burnout. Some actually ended up quitting their more prominent DAO. One even assumed a different alias and entered back into the DAO ecosystem, but with a different, um, you know, identity. So that way they didn't carry the baggage of having to have all this um, DAO responsibility and people looking to them on, on that sort of weight on their shoulders. And then others just, you know, they kind of stayed burnt out, but they forged ahead because they didn't have successors or they didn't have other people that they would rotate into the leadership. And so they were just plunking forward, but expressed not feeling um, particularly high amounts of satisfaction with the work that they were doing. And so this is this slump was one that some mentioned avoiding or um, finding themselves getting out of it by having their own personal practices. Maybe they had a therapist or a coach or a really strong network. They also had a context that maybe they entered in during the bull run. So they knew what the potential was, which helped them during the bear market. Or they had more discernment where they made sure that they were keeping friends that weren't only web three friends to ground them to a bit of, you know, outside perspective. And so some of those practices are what then ultimately led people to practice greater selection, prioritization and shift their focus to get to honestly just work that was more aligned to their own personal purpose and to their own personal strengths. And that's what often led people to their upswing in their journey. And so the question that I would pose to all of you to be considering is where are you at in your own personal journey and what's working well and where are you getting stuck? And so this is something that you can just reflect on if you want to put into the chat, you know, maybe where you're at, that you're tumbling down the rabbit hole, you're excited about possibilities, you're practicing deeper selection, maybe you're getting better personal boundaries. That was a key insight from a lot of the people we interviewed was just the importance of having personal boundaries in a forest. You can participate in tons of DAOs simultaneously environment. But what's working well for you and where are you getting stuck? You know, I personally say what's working well for me is, um, you know, choosing sort of like a niche role and sticking to it. You know, uh, oftentimes in DAOs and, you know, early startups in general, a lot of people wear a lot of different hats. But one thing I've noticed is just that, you know, doing something right, especially in the beginning, you know, um, you know, is, is, is pretty powerful. But um, yeah, I mean, that's I don't know if that's too relevant, but that's kind of that's, that's where I'm coming from. Yeah, great. Thank you. Maybe we hear from one other. I'd be happy to share. Um, okay. Sorry for coming late. My name is Michael Sturmiger. Some of you know me as Michael Skyfield. Um, what came up for me in response to this was that for me, I'm pretty, I'm getting a lot more comfortable with the idea that in my leadership practice, success means helping my, having an influence on my peers, feeling safe to take risks. Um, and in a, in a permissionless environment, also helping to initiate or cultivate the containers that constrain interactions and effort so it doesn't just fly apart. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, where I'm getting, getting stuck is I'm very new to DAOs. And tr like, so I see some other people are into the, the excrecy things as holacracy and sociocracy practitioners here. Um, trying to break people's framing in the legacy way of doing things, even just to listen and say, uh, you know, suspend your disbelief, even just for an hour, and let's dem let's try, you know, just come to a meeting that's structured a different way and try it and see if it feels different. Um, that's been really hard. So I'm really excited about how that barrier isn't there as much in the DAO space. So mm -hmm. that may be getting unstuck, but we'll see. I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, great. Yeah, and I think this is a continual reflection to come back to is what's working well for you? Where are you getting stuck? And what do you wanna do different the next time around or in, in the future? 
And so a lot of this leads us to what is like the inner work and the outer work of leadership. And we talked a lot about the outer work of, you know, there's personal leadership, but there's your task and their change and your people leadership that you need to be doing for that outer work. But also within the inner work, there's this idea of Daniel, who's, you know, obviously here. He was one of the people that we interviewed and shared that he pursues developing himself. And, and as a consequence, that impacts everything. And that really is what we found from self-leadership, but also what research has told us about leadership since the beginning is that having that personal fortitude uh, changes everything for what you're able to do with the outer work of leadership. And then um, Mark from Mandino Dow shared with us that he's heard from many people regarding Dow's that it's the ego, um, that the ego plays tricks on you, feeling that you're the only one that's important to the decentralized organization is living wrong. And so what is mojo over ego? You know, obviously that's part of the talk. And that's really, when I came into the space and conducted this work, that that's what became really clear was people talking more about really needing to come into the space with a humble stature, but also you can't just be so humble that you hang back because it is so open and it is such a blank canvas that actually the people who are really leading in this space that are really advancing work are these people who are leading more with this sense of mojo. And Mojo I like because it has a little bit of almost like a gamer um, background, which this space often has some um, nuances within its culture from that. But it's this idea of this magic power of practically speaking, knowing yourself, knowing what your strengths and your potential contributions are to a DAO's purpose, and then confidently coming with those asks and offers into the space. And so really Mojo is about being humble, but also being helpful enough to say, this is what I'm great at. I see what you guys are trying to accomplish and I see how I might play a role in that and then stepping into that space. And the ego, the ego is not without function here. The ego is really your sense of self-importance and it can be really good, but we wanna keep it in check, especially within DAOs and when you're trying to create and cultivate shared leadership within an organization, you wanna be open and humble, avoiding becoming that central point of failure we talk about that central point of failure within blockchain. That's absolute, absolutely true to me within organizations. When I look at traditional organizations that I used to work for of how hierarchical they are and how focused they are on one manager, that to me is a central point of failure within a social ecosystem where that one person has the lens on whether someone can get promoted or not, how much pay they have, whether they're doing their job or not. All those things... Um, become so consolidated that it actually becomes less effective. And so DAOs have this ability to open up that function and to allow people to really truly come with what they're great at and then hopefully get rewarded for contributing in amazing ways. And so we wanna make sure that we're constantly redistributing the context, the information, the power, and the authority. And that to me is one of the key practices that we don't ask of leaders in traditional organizations that we absolutely need to be asking of ourselves in DAOs is, am I a central point of failure? And am I constantly focused on redistributing the context, information, power, and authority that I'm amassing? Because when people gather, leaders emerge and they will amass power, authority, information, and context. And so it is this practice of redistributing that back out. And that I think is going to be important for all sorts of work in the future. One of the questions that I then ask myself is, have we built the personal fortitude to navigate the systematic influence? And already in the future of work, one of the things you see is people um, getting excited about innovation possibilities based on artificial intelligence and this idea that we can have more automation, more data that helps guide us. And yet what's not entirely clear if we know from psychology and research of studies past, we know that the system matters, the structure you put people into really does influence their behavior. The Stanford experiment, prison experiment, maybe being one of the more famous examples there, where you tell people you have power over these people and they start acting like they do. So the structure matters. But we also know through a lot of research that the individual matters. Um, you know, Man's Search for Meaning is one of, I think, the most um, applauded leadership books of all time. And it has a lot to do with the notion of personal choice 
and what you have the ability to choose regardless of what system you're a part of. And so for me, what we know from research and from personal experience is that both the system and the person matter. And yet what I am constantly questioning in this space is as we lean more heavily on what technological innovations will do for us, and those will move at lightning speed, faster and faster. They're already doing quite a lot. Just today, there was on one of my newsletters that AI has now, um, I think it was Oxford University and Harvard has predictive capabilities for how different pandemic strains in the future might advance. So we could head those off if a second, you know, another pandemic came along. So there's already amazing things that we might be able to rely on it for. But have we found the ways to accelerate our own development of our personal fortitude, of our personal ability to lead in the space and discern what's best and healthy and going to lead to a greater flourishing state for ourselves and others that we care about. And so that to me is a lot of the work of leadership is even more heavily bent for building up the personal aspects of what does it mean for us to step into our own leadership. And I guess one of the big encouragements that came out of the study of the 23 people that we interviewed was the importance of this not being something you do on your own. And that's really one of the beautiful invitations of DAOs altogether is that you don't have to start an organization on your own. You don't have to advance a cause on your own, um, that you do it in community. And so some of the key roles that people mentioned throughout our interviews were having peer mentors, having an experienced mentor that's further down the path that you want to be on, having inspirations that maybe you never talk to directly, but you get a lot from listening to them or connecting with their content and media, niche connections to help you get a more nuanced view of the DAO ecosystem, and coach, therapist, the broader community. But also a lot of people mentioned the importance of having non-Web3 peers to keep them grounded in the perspective that's coming from the outside right now. And so my question to all of you would be to consider what support might you need to build, particularly right now? What even in that last image that I showed you makes you think, oh, I might have a gap there, or I actually am really strong there and I might need to lean into that more frequently. So what support might you need to build? And again, feel free to share in the chat, but otherwise I'll have, I have one more slide here that I wanna layer on. So as you share in the chat and share with one another of you know, what support you might need to build, also, one of the things that came from our insights from interviewing these 23 different um, people within the DAO ecosystem was understanding that they, at an organizational level, felt really um, compelled to bring clarity to where their focus would be. And so a lot of people have the focus and the priority at the community level, um, or maybe it's the founding team or the core team that's showing up each day. What I loved from John from Cab and Dow was this notion that a lot of what's really advancing um, the work across the Dow ecosystem is just these small teams of like three people. And it doesn't, of course, have to be just three, but that really resonated with me because I've seen now through practice a lot of groups that maybe the community feels like it's not coalescing, or maybe the founding team feels like it's sequestered off a bit, or there's not that same level of transparency that they had at the beginning. And yet still somehow these DAOs, even in a bear market and when things are tough, are advancing work. And often it's when you're getting a small team of people together that have clarity on what their task is and really feel compelled by the purpose that drives it. And so that's one of the conversations to have is to where, where do you want to support the efforts the most? understanding that the work is being advanced at all these different levels. And then also there's these um, spectrums to make decisions, decisions off of. And so as a small team, or maybe it's as a community, wherever you choose to focus, how centralized versus decentralized do you want to be? I think we know by now that even though there's the promise of decentralization, most DAOs start at a pretty centralized level. Um, so that way they can coordinate efforts better at the start. And then they have a roadmap of progressive decentralization. So 
So where do you really want to fall in there? And how do you communicate with others how you're making advancements toward becoming decentralized? What are those milestones? And there's also this notion of private or transparent. One um, person that we interviewed was talking about how they had an experience that was um, very dysfunctional in the sense that they found out partway through that there was private channels and it really didn't allow them to do their, their job well or to have insight into how the group was functioning at the time. And so they actually went, when they started their own DAO, they created more of a radical transparency view toward it, where every channel was um, visible to anybody in the DAO at any point. And some of them were read only, so that way you wouldn't get um, you know, inefficiencies created by it, but all the channels are completely transparent where you can read everything that's happening um, in any conversation. And that to me is something that I think the future of work has a lot to learn from um, is to how do we make things more transparent that really have, have only good that they can do by being more transparent. And then curated versus open, and that's really about the community. And one of the things that I know we're advancing a lot on in the last year is on the legal aspect of DAOs. So how do we ensure that if you're going to have a curated community, if that means somebody needs to buy a token, that opens them up to an, an additional liability. And so how do you communicate to members about that? that there's additional liability with when they join a more curated community um, versus say maybe a more open one. So hopefully that seeds your mind with some additional thoughts about what does it really mean to advance the work of DAOs right now and what conversations might you need to have, whether it's with peers that you're working with, whether that's because you're part of shaping the organizational structure or evolving the organizational structure, or whether it's just an, of an interest of yours to understand um, what conversations do need to be had when thinking about evolving a DAO and its work. And so the next steps that I'd encourage you, and we'll open it up for just dialogue and questions here at the end, but I wanted to leave you with some specific thoughts. One is to prioritize yourself. You know, I remember there would be, when I was a young professional, there'd be evenings where I'd be sitting there in my cubicle and the lights would go out on the floor because it'd be 9 p.m. at night and I'm still there working again. And, you know, I would have somebody like a manager sometimes that would come over and say, go home, like, just go home. <laughs> it's time to be done. And I find that in DAOs, we really need to up our care for one another, but also our care for ourselves because there's not necessarily that person especially if you participate in a number of DAOs, that's going to say, be done with all your DAOs right, right now. <laughs> you know, they might even tell you, like, shut it off and go to bed. They might tell you that, but then you realize, oh, I'm also doing work for this DAO and this DAO and this project. And so prioritizing yourself and knowing when to give yourself <laughs> the boundary that you need is, is absolutely critical. And then reflect on your own personal purpose and build your network of support. That's what's you know, keeping people involved and pe keeping people going. And then practice mojo over ego. The, the easiest way for me to help people lean into mojo is challenge yourself to ask like five more questions than you normally would tomorrow. Like just do it, ask more questions and you already will be channeling more of your mojo versus your ego. And then um, the last thing is engage in more clarifying conversations within your organization. So what um, level of transparency versus privacy or decentralization versus centralization? How are you communicating about the evolving nature of your organization to your organization? All those things become really important when it comes to appreciating, imagining, and clarifying um, what's happening within the DAO. And so you'll notice there's some beautiful artwork here. It's actually my husband. He's, he's an artist that makes beautiful artworks. He's a board game graphic designer in his normal day job. And one of the things that became clear from the insights from the people that we studied was they talked a lot about this idea that in the past, people would kind of help you get to the next step on the journey. And yet in DAOs, it's more like people act as lighthouses to illuminate the landscape. And you're really the only person that can decide what that best next step is for you. And I love that. And I also see the overwhelm in that. And so it becomes really important that we allow ourselves when practicing leadership in DAOs to be the lighthouse, 
but also to um, encourage people along their way to have that permissionless nature to own their own journey and to choose what that step is for them and to ultimately help make it safe for them to choose what's best for them. And so I, with that, I want to thank you. That, And I also do want to open it up for um, questions. I know we're ending our time here today, but really appreciate all of you joining here. And um, yeah, would love to stick around and see if there's anything people want to comment on or share. Thanks for tuning in. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lisa. Very, very uh, eye-opening and uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation. Um, but yeah, we do have one question in the chat. Um, so Annie, uh, Anna asks, um, have you seen hol holacracy or sociocracy uh, 3.0 structures in DAOs? Ooh, um, in DAOs being practiced intentionally. Um, it's not that I haven't seen it. Um, and yeah, I'm seeing some claps. So maybe others can can say that they've, they've seen it for sure. What I can say is Holacracy is one of the books when people talk about how they're developing their DAO, how they're founding it, what's influencing it. Holacracy is absolutely one of the key influences, the work being done at Inspiral. Um, Many other books like Reinventing Organizations, that is a very common one. So these are some of the key influences, but I would say that I have yet to see a DAO that's really effective at doing highly efficiently facilitated meetings using holacracy. But if others have, I would love them to name drop. Let's let's look at what's working well. Excellent. Yeah, it seems uh, Michael... Uh, says that he implements um, S3 uh, practices in his org design. So if mm. he's still with us, maybe you want to give us maybe a little high level uh, perspective. Yeah, I'm still with you. Um, the first uh, important point being that I'm new to DAOs and I'm still finding my way. So I, I'm perhaps on the verge of stepping into a more active leadership position and an opportunity to uh, to lead and facilitate and share the patterns that I have been uh, yeah, cultivating over the last few years. Um, the thing that I'd say would resonate with me in, in your comment, Lisa, not necessarily noticing it is, I mean, because the whole concept of S3 is like it's, I mean, one way of describing it, a menu of patterns and practices that can be drawn upon when habitual ways of doing things aren't leading to the outcomes you want. So, you know, one little pattern could be just thrown into the way you choose your next response or to everything like a multi-day workshop that that designs an organization. Um, so all I can say right now um, is that, yeah, I'm, I, I wish that... <laughs> This was in like a few months from now, so I actually have some experience to share. Um, but all I can do is say is stay tuned for now. Yeah, that's my best honest answer. Wonderful. Great. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have one question. Um, so I know you mentioned a bit how, you know, early on it's important that, you know, the there's a shared purpose. So one thing that uh, a sentiment I've heard in the past is, um, you know, especially early on, it's important for the founder to really be um, active in driving the vision and galvanizing support and sort of as the organization scales a bit, then they could delegate some of their, I, I don't want to call authority, but um, yeah, some of their responsibilities, I guess, or authority, whatever you want to call it. Um or influence, um, you know, to other members. Just kind of curious to see what maybe your perspective on that is, mm. like early founders and organizations, and how involved they should be at the beginning, as opposed to like, you know, as as they reach maturity. Yeah, um, you know, there's not one answer to this, but for example, within Talent DAO, we had two people that initially set a direction, a, a vision out there and then put out a tally form and myself and maybe six others responded to it right away. And the eight of us essentially became the founding group of Talent Out, where we co-authored a manifesto together. And so what I love about that is there were two people initially that set the direction. And even, you know, one of those 
ultimately ended up ebbing out of a more core leadership role because they could, because at that point, then it was a small group that had this shared purpose and vision. And from there, um, what I always recommend to people is you want to take a good look at who those early founders are and ensure that there's the diversity that you want to exist in your broader community, because that early group is going to be highly indicative of how things end up sprawling. And so if you're not pleased with the diversity or or the insights or the debate or the culture that's set within that small team, you want to change that while it's small before you unleash it to scale. Um, so those would be some of the insights that I would share is that I think um, the work of leadership is often looked at as setting direction. So you do need to galvanize people. That is really important. And if you've got people who are passionate about that, bring them into the fold and let them evolve it with you. Excellent. Excellent. Makes sense. Perfect. Um, all right. Anyone else has any questions for Lisa? Just, I know we're already over time, <clears throat> but very quickly, maybe you could give us some perspective on the intersection of leadership and governance, because I find that you can do your best to empower people and help them understand the purpose of a DAO and the way that they can shape the future and the decisions that are made. And then nobody participates in governance. So, yeah, just really quickly, given the time that we're already over time, if you, if you have any quick insights. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. I just spoke last week at ETH Milan on a panel on DAOs and governance. And it was a lot of this looking at the fact that there's this very um, important side to a DAO working. And it has a lot to do with how you actually vote and how you participate in governance and how you make those decisions as a community, along with all the legal implications of that. And I think one of the things that came up from the panel is a lot of times people aren't engaging in governance, one, because they don't know what exposure that opens themselves up to. It seems like an extra deeper step in the DAO process. And so helping people become more aware of what exposure or liability or responsibility comes with governance. Again, to a lot of people that can seem like, okay, but that's basically like raising red flags and gonna keep them further away um, from governance that's already having a hard time getting people to consistently participate and care. And so the idea though, is that one, you need to be transparent with what exposure people have if they're participating within governance within any organization. And then the second thing, when it comes to leadership specifically, what I feel like is this is a challenge, regardless of what organization, whether you're at a DAO or another group, is what do you expect of members of your community? And how are you making that clear? And then how do we improve the user experience of people voicing their perspective? And a lot of times what I hear from people is they're just involved in too many DAOs, that it takes too much time. And another thing I've heard recently that is such a not good thing for governance is that people are putting proposals, having chat GPT write their proposals. So they'll get these like 30 page, really long sounds intelligence, but intelligent, but nobody's ever going to read them. And that to me could kill people's interest in participating in governance if we, um, again, don't tell people or, you know, like clarify what's expected of members on their relationship with governance as being a community member, and then make it clear and a good user experience for them to participate in that. So obviously that's a big nut to crack, but with the little time we have, that's what I'd share. For sure. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. Well, if there is no other questions, uh, we'll wrap it up. And yeah, once again, Lisa, really, really appreciate your time. It was really wonderful having you on. And yeah, hope to uh, continue the conversation hopefully sometime in the future. Yeah, and feel free to reach out. I'm Lisa Woken on all things, Telegram, Twitter, all, all the things. So really appreciate and love geeking out with people about this concept. So if it's a passion of yours, please feel free to connect.